<clears throat> all righty good morning guys can you hear me yes we can hear you how are we doing um i'm doing good how are you hanging in there right so this is the uh this is the last lecture of uh, 623 and um uh I sent out an email yesterday about uh, office hours. Right, so I switch over here. Uh, right, so so this is the last lecture. Right, so we have office hours. Uh, Friday, uh, and then next week it'll be on Wednesday and Thursday. And this is all at nine. And uh, projects are due. Uh, on Thursday at midnight. Okay, so these are, yeah, put in some extra office hours in case some of you have questions. Um, the, um, so before I start on today's lecture, I just, I wanna give you guys a chance to ask uh, questions about the material or uh, what other questions you may have. You also have so tomorrow morning we will also have uh, office hours so that will be in time for um, uh, for the due date for homework six. Homework six is as we talked about last time it just requires a little change to what you did in homework five. Okay, so if there are no questions, then uh, so to today um, we only have one thing uh, on the agenda and that is uh, that is to use uh, Monte Carlo simulation uh, to price uh, Americans. And um, the way that we want to do this is there are going to be two components. So the first component is going to be a little uh, little crash course. Uh, on linear regression. I'm sure uh, most of you have seen this uh, in one way or another. So, and then, and then the second one is going to be, we're going to do an example uh, from uh, this paper of Longstaff and Swartz. Uh, 
and let me just show you uh, this paper is uh, I think it's 2001 maybe. let me just show you the paper <clears throat> So this here is the um, this is the paper I'm talking about, long ever towards. This is uh, how to price uh, op uh, American options using this uh, least square approach, and and this is the same thing as linear regression. So that's where we're going to start. Uh, and this example I'm going to be doing is is the example that's in the paper. Right. So this is this first section example. So you have a numerical example that will take you. And I'll take us through um, how to apply their uh, their algorithm uh, to price an American uh, to price an American put option. So I'll just I'll I'll go through that first section uh, in their paper, and then if you're interested uh, at some point or some point later in your life, you're going to need it. Uh, you you will then you then read. Uh, you could start by read, looking at the remaining part of the paper. They do other things in here. They, for example, also price. Um, they also price uh, Amer American Bermudian options. So, uh, so this is the evaluation of American puts. And we just flip down to some of the other things they do. Uh, this one here. There's also like they are pricing more exotic options. And so. <clears throat> this chapter number, this chapter number uh, number two, where the um, you can see that these functions down here, uh, L one and so on. And if you flip over to the homework, you'll recognize that that some of these functions are also in the homework. If we go down here to that optional problem number two, you can see that there are these functions down here, L1, L2, L3, and so on. And I have two different classes of functions. So these functions, these L functions here, they are like basis functions that you use when you, uh, when you perform uh, regression. So, but again, this, this problem here is optional because we are at the very end of the semester. Somehow this time when I was teaching, we, we did other stuff early on. And, uh, and this material on pricing the American uh, put option using Monte Carlo simulation got pushed off to the very end. So uh, this problem here is optional, but you can see these. There are some uh, Laguerre polynomials, and then you await it. And if you go back to the uh, uh, back to the paper that um, that we're discussing, you'll you'll find you'll find similar functions uh, in there. But again, so what we'll be doing today is we'll go through this example here um, in, the, in the first section, and this is plenty to understand what the method is uh, that you're proposing, what the algorithm is that you're proposing. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so let me um, let me switch over. So. First, we're going to talk a little bit about what does it mean to do linear regression, and then and then we'll do the example. I don't expect this here to take three hours uh, to get through, so uh, we we'll see we we'll see how it goes. And again, if you have questions, by all means, uh, uh, just interrupt and, and ask. Oh, the last thing I should say here is uh, so. Since we have a very small class, uh, please fill out, uh, please fill out uh, the uh, course evaluations. I think we only have five students enrolled, and then we have uh, there are some some more students that are following the lectures. I don't know if you're just following the lectures if you're allowed to fill out the evaluations, but for those of you that are enrolled. Um, Please fill out the evaluations in particular when we only have uh, so few students. So the um, so linear regression this is also what they refer to as the least square the least squares uh, estimate <clears throat> so 
So what will so so say say you have a random variable. Uh, say you have a y. This is a random variable, and you can write this. This is this decomposition. So you have a coefficient beta, and you have another coefficient beta one multiplied onto x, and then you have epsilon. So say you have a linear model like this one. Right, so the betas be a constant. So this is a constant. And this is a constant. On the other hand, so this here is the definition of y. And so x here and epsilon, these are random variables. The random variables uh, with um, uh, typically assume that they are independent. Um, you can actually get away with saying that they just don't correlate in the covariance between x and epsilon is zero. But let's just say that they are independent. So very often, so often, but not always, uh, you see, you see additional assumptions being placed. You will see that um, epsilon is assumed to be standard normal with mean zero and uh, variance uh, Sigma epsilon squared. You will also see um, you see stuff like this. You'll also see stuff like um, x. Uh, you'll see assumptions like that. The expectation of x is zero, and that the variance of x is one. And this is because. <clears throat> beta zero right this is what's going to account for the mean and you have this beta one this is going to help with the variance so this here is just a normalization that's not a big deal this is just a normalization <clears throat> so if we have the structure what we're interested in is figuring out what these coefficients are so to get so so what are So what are beta zero and beta one? Well, if you take the mean up here, under the assumption that X and epsilon have zero mean. So, so we're gonna start out with beta zero. So when X and epsilon have zero means, Well, then we have that the expectation of y is going to be just beta zero. Right, so beta zero is the mean of y. So that was one of them. And how do we get the variance? How do we get beta one? Well, if I look at, <coughs> if I look at, um, So look at y minus then this beta zero is mean. And I want to do a multiple onto x and I take the expectation. So what would this become? <clears throat> I'll use the formula y minus beta zero that goes in here. So y minus beta zero is going to be beta one x plus epsilon times x. And then I'm using, what am I using? I'm using I have beta one here and then x. So I have beta one outside and then I'll have the expectation of x squared. And then I'll have plus 
uh, it'll be the covariance between epsilon and x, right? And this is what we'll be having. Uh, we'll be working under the assumption that this is equal to uh, zero, and we'll work under the assumption that we'll we'll have these ones here. That, <clears throat> that this one here is equal to one. Then we end up here with beta one. The, the two coefficients of here, the uh, given in terms of um, in terms of y's mean and y's covariance with uh, with x. Like this one here, this one here is the covariance of y and x. So what that does is that it gives us um it gives us uh if, if we have so so say we have say we have uh, uh two uh, sequences this is where the linear regression comes in so say we have two sequences uh, you'll have y1 y2 so these are little y's up to y capital n there'll be one sequence and the other one will be x1 x2 up to xn <clears throat> and we want to regress uh, y on x so what we want to do is we want to say we want to say that y i is approximately equal to uh, beta 0 plus beta 1 times xi and how should we choose how should we choose these coefficients uh, well I'll put a head on because the estimates now. So where, where, what, where beta hat? Well, what is beta hat? Beta hat zero. This was the mean of y. Okay, so I'll just take the mean. I'll take the mean of uh, of the data points that I have. So this is two sequences of data. These two. I'll take the average of the y's. This is going to be my. This is going to be the uh, the intercept. So beta zero is going to be the mean. This is the average of the y's. And this is the intercept. And then we need the slope. What's the slope going to look like? This was my beta one. The slope is going to be this covariance. The slope is going to be this covariance. So, uh, how would we estimate the covariance? We would take. Uh, uh, If we take over here, we'll have my beta one. So I need to estimate these differences here. So it will be, um, it will be the sum of yi minus beta zero hat times xi, i equals one to n. Then normalize it out here with either one over n or one over n minus one, and then everything divided by, and then the variance of x. So this is going to be it's going to be x i minus x i is mean. Uh, what is x i is mean? This is one over n. So from k equals one to n of x j squared. But this part here, this is x is uh, this is the mean mean of x one up to x n. 
And so again, there should be a coefficient here, but the same coefficient should be up here, so it will cancel out and form this. Are we good so far? So this gives me the two uh, coefficients, and then <clears throat> what I'll have is I'll, I'll say that well, yi, there's now a relationship between yi and the xi, and there's this linear relationship. But this one here, that's the intercept, so the, and this one here, this is the slope. And the last thing I want to say about linear regression is uh, you'll also have um, there's a way to measure the quality, like what how how good is this? How good is this uh, approximation? So so quality. So quality quality is often measured by this um, uh, R squared. So let me see if I can derive what that is. <clears throat> what is the what is the error you're making? I mean the, the error term, this is my epsilon, right? So this is y minus these two quantities. This is y minus these two quantities. So I'll have my epsilon. My epsilon will be y minus beta zero minus beta one x. And then if I look at if I look at the variance of y. The variance of y, this is a constant, so I'm going to get beta 1 squared, the variance of x plus the variance of epsilon, again, because there's no covariation between epsilon and x. Right, but this one here was zero because there's no covariance between x and epsilon. So how would I measure how would I measure uh, the quality? Well, if I look at the overall variance of y, I want to see how much how much comes from the error terms and how much comes from the um, uh, the beta zero minus beta one. So if you look at so beta one squared, right? So it's the sum of these two. If I look at this thing relative to the variance of y. <clears throat> this is going to be a number between zero and one. This is a this is my R square. This is a uh, this is a measure for uh, for how much how much of y's variance uh, beta beta plus beta beta zero plus beta one times x account for. So you'll see this uh, R squared. So back to the data. So, if, so for data, uh, you'll have this R squared. This is reported as, uh, I need this beta one that I estimated. And then I need the variance of X. So this would be, um, uh, would be X I minus this one over N sum of X J. But that will be an expression. Again, I need to divide by uh, one over n or one over n minus one. But I'm going to be dividing here by exactly the same coefficient, so I don't worry about it. And then I'll divide here by uh, the sum from one to n. That coefficient cancels out the coefficient from up here. And I'll have y i minus beta zero hat. And this here will then be a number uh, between zero and one. So R2 belongs to uh, zero, one, and, and, um, and values closer uh, to one are preferred. Preferred. 
be third. Is that right? There's two hours in there. Three third. Are we good so far? So this is linear regression. Um, there's also this least square estimate. So let me just put in uh, one word about that. So why is it called least squared? So it's called this uh, regression. This uh, is also called least squares estimates. And that's because, because what? If I look at the conditional expectation of y given x, okay, so I'll plug in what y is. This is uh, what was beta zero plus beta one x plus my epsilon. And so now if epsilon and x are independent, so here we need epsilon not just to have zero covariance, but actually be independent, then we can drop that term here. And we just get beta zero plus beta one times x. So we know we know that this conditional expectation, this is this is the best L2 uh, estimate. Right, this is the best S2 estimate of Y. <clears throat> Long time ago, you would have seen, uh, you might have seen, uh, those of you that took my 621 class, you would have seen this exercise. But Stochastic calculus for finance, and then you flip over to the conditional expectation section. So this is over in section two. We go down to one of the exercises down on page seven seven. <clears throat> you see something like this one. So here. Here it says that the conditional expectation, it minimizes the variance of the error among all estimates. So this is what is meant here. This is this exercise 2.7 in Shreve 2. Like a random variable that we're having, a random variable y is not x measurable. So you project down to all x measurable random variables and uh, you pick the one that has the smallest variance. So this here was exercise. 2.7 in Shreve uh, volume two. So that's why it's called least squares. The squares come from this two up here in L2. <clears throat> so I figured we should look at a little example on how this works in practice. Yeah, I, I just I put together an example, so I thought I'd have a look at it. So I'm hoping you can all see my MATLAB editor now. Uh, so this here is a very simple regression. Um, yeah, it's it's very simple regression, right? So it's I took one of the things that we have been doing uh, uh, early on when we did the Kaliski factorization for the multidimensional normal. And so what I did was I took, I took a uh, college, so it's a two by two, right? I have X's and Y's, and I'm gonna simulate first um, D1 
these data points, so the X's and the XI's and the YI's. And I'm saying, okay, let me, um, let me plug in, let me simulate uh, with a row that is minus 0.9. So we went, we go, we do this Kolesky factorization, you get independent uh, normals, and then you, um, you don't need these U's here. Um, inside my uh, Z is where I have the independent normals, and then the X's are the ones that are going to become uh, dependent normals. And so all I'm doing is I'm just, I'm simulating a two-dimensional uh, Gaussian random variable with a correlation negative uh, negative uh, 0 0.9 and there's zero means. So I call them X and Ys. And then of course we always plot to see if it works, if it looks reasonable. And, um, and now we won't do it. Uh, so maybe I do need the use, so we keep the use. And I get this picture that you guys have also had. So there's a negative correlation. Um, so the slope is downward, right? And so what we want to do is um, we want to regress uh, x's on, uh, we want to use the first coordinate to explain the second coordinate. And, um, and how do we do that? Well, uh, we're going to perform linear regression, right? So we're going to put a straight line in here somewhere. We have to compute the interception on the y-axis, and we're going to compute the slope based upon uh, this family of x-i's and y-i's. And so the way that we do it is we regress. So the first, so let me just lower the number of points. We can actually have a look at them uh, side by side. A thousand points is a little bit too much to print out. So here I have my 10 points. Again, you can see there is some sort of a, a negative dependency on them. The slope is, is going to be negative and the intercept, I don't know where the intercept is going to be. Ideally, it should be zero because they both have mean zero. Um, so I form a matrix. I really, I, I'm using my X to explain the Y variable. So I have uh, the first column in my A matrix is going to be ones. And then I'm going to have X. So if you look at it on a picture, this here is my matrix, right? So the first variable is just going to be a bunch of ones. This is the constant coefficient. And then the second one is going to be all my X variables. And I want to explain, right? I also have my Y. I want to explain, I want to explain the Y using. So here I have my Y variables. I want to use uh, a constant and then the X variables to explain these Y variables up here. And so the way that I do it is I, uh, I regress. I find these beta zero and beta ones, right? and I stack them in into uh, a matrix called uh, beta. And that's the one you see here. So you see the intercept is 0 0.014. It's not far away from the zero that it ought to be. Uh, the slope is negative eight, uh, 0.4, which is not far away from that negative 0.9 that, that we simulated based upon. And then what I can do is I can I can move on. <clears throat> I form my epsilon, and um, I can compute uh, r squared uh, according to the formula that we had before. Uh, so the r squared here is 8.7, uh, which is <clears throat> very very high for when you try to do this regression. <clears throat> so typically not get so high values. And if I increase this to like a thousand, <clears throat> then I cannot print it out anymore because it's just going to be too wild. Then run it again <clears throat> and get the slopes to be uh, minus 9.91 uh, and you get the intercept to be zero. So that looks good. And then R squared is sitting up between uh, 0 0.81. This is very, very high R squared value. So this is how you do linear regression. <clears throat> Normally, you will not have data coming from, uh, from like this Kolesky factorization. You will have data that you observe in, uh, in practice. But here, we're just pretending. So uh, just seeing how does the regression work on, a, uh, on an example that we're familiar with.
And as you can see here, you can regress on more. You don't just have to regress, you could put more things in here. Like here, I regress on a constant, and then I regress on X, but you could put more things in here. And this, we exactly want to put more things in here uh, when we get into the long step and swaps. Are there any questions on this part? Any questions on this linear regression? Okay, then we'll move into the um, the long step and swaps. And now let me bring up the paper again so we can look at it together. So this is the long step and swaps. And so the first order of business is uh, to simulate paths. So that's the first thing that, that we need to do. Um, in this example, the long step and swaps is considering. Um, this here is their simulated paths of the stock. Yeah. So let me just record a few key things. So the first thing, so it's an American food, just like in your uh, in your homework. It's an American food. Um, it has exercise times at being one, two, and three. Right, so there are four time periods. You can see T0, T1, T2, and T3. So you cannot exercise at time zero. You can exercise at time one, two, and three. So tor takes values between uh, one and three, one, two, and three. And the strike is 1.1. So that's my K. K is equal to 1.1. Then there is a risk-free interest rate of 6%. Okay, so R is equal to 0 0.06. And then you're given, um, you're giving uh, stock prices. So the, again, you simulate on the risk neutral measure, right? So under the risk neutral measure, the in interest rate has to be the drift of the stock, right? So you have DST. Oh, let me write so you can see it here right on a document camera so you can see it. I'm just recording the things that we read out loud. We have an American put, the stopping times can take values one, two, and three, or, and, and infinity if you never exercise. K is a strike. This is equal to 1.1. The interest rate is equal to 0 0.06, 0 0.06. DST is then gonna be, or it's gonna be ST, and then uh, you are under the risk neutral measure. So uh, this will be, uh, the drift here will be uh, 0 0.06 uh, DT. And then there'll be some volatility, few in black shoals. And then this is the risk neutral measure. And the homework, I forget what I put the volatility to, which is just typically something like uh, 0.3 or 0.2 uh, are typical. which is constant. So do you have a model? And this is the, this one here is the risk neutral measure. This is the risk neutral measure. <clears throat> so what you do is step number one is to simulate, simulate. Uh, so here we have, you simulate eight pairs starting at, uh, I think you start out, the initial value was just one. So they simulated eight pairs uh, of S starting at one. Okay, so let's look at them again. Uh, 
So these are the pairs that we have here. We've got our eight pairs starting at one. Uh, so you can use whatever simulation. So you can use Euler, you can use a Milstein scheme. Uh, that's up to you. You'll create these pairs somehow. And uh, this is how they came out in, in their numerics. And so what you do is you start out at the end. We are always doing this dynamical programming where you start out at the end. So you start out here, the end is at time three, and then you work yourself backwards. So <clears throat> when you're sitting at, uh, at the end and you're considering going from two to three, it's, it's like a European one. Right? So, so what we do is we, we look at these eight pairs and we check out which ones are in the money. Right, so we remember, remember the strike was 1.1, uh, right? And an American option pays out, if you exercise it, uh, this American put pays out 1.1 minus the stock price. Okay, so 1.1 minus the stock price. And what we want to get is we look for the pairs at time three that are in the money. I said it'll be one here. So that'll be pairs three, pairs four, Path six and path seven. So let me record that on the paper here. I think we, we can we can keep track of that. The later ones, uh, I'm gonna start writing on the paper, but here in the beginning, it's not so complicated. But right, we're looking at which paths are in the money at time three. It will be path three, four, six, and seven. So that's what's recorded down in the next one here. We exercise. And what, when we exercise, we're going to get 1.1 minus on pair three, it'll be minus 1.03. So that's what's going to give you this 0 0.07 here. And the next one, 1.1 minus 0.92, this will give us 0 0.18 uh, and, and so on. So we'll have how many payoffs? There'll be four payoffs. Like there'll be four pairs up here that are in the money, pairs three, four, six, and seven. So this is what we have here. So there's no difference at the end. This is what you write here. There's no difference between a European and an American in the last period. So now it gets to be more tricky because this is where we start doing regression. And um, so the next table, I'm gonna write that out on paper, but keep in mind that the path that we're interested in um, uh, at the end is where we looked, right? So at time three, we were looking for it in the money. So now we're gonna to move to time two. Right, and we want to be looking at it again for in the money. So in the money at time two, this will be pairs what? So we're going to look at 1.1 and we have to look at for where is the stock price less than 1.1. So that'll be path one. It'll be path number three. It'll be pairs number four, and it'll be pairs six and seven. Okay, so that's just recorded, right? So this was pairs one, three, four, six, and seven. Those are the ones that are gonna be in the money, right? So now here comes the regression part, and this is the more tricky one. So let me write that out on a piece of paper. Write that out on a piece of paper. All right, so in the money at time two is what we have here. So we want to have, so this is, and then we need regression. This is uh, where regression comes in. And uh, so you need an X variable. And the X variable, um, the X variable that you're going to have is. Uh, you're going to pick x to be s2. All right, so we're going to regress y on x and we're going to be regressing here on s2. So the stock price at time two. Okay, and what are we going to be regressing? We're going to be regressing y. So how, how do they define y? <clears throat> well, we aim the money here on these paths. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to take the values that we had at time three and discount them. So this is e to the minus r and then there'll be a delta t step. I think in there's, so you're simplifying this to say that this is just equal to one, right? And r again was this 6%. And then you take the payoff at 
at the end, k minus is three uh, positive pi. So that's their y. So, so we have paths one, three, four, six, and seven. So we have five paths. We need to compute these five values of x. And we need to compute these five values of y. But the thing to note here is that this S3, this is not, this is not F2 measurable. Right? X is, but y is not. And that's where the regression comes in. This is not if too measurable, we, we can still calculate it, right? So this is what you're doing in that table. You're figuring out uh, what is K and again, K, K here was 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, K was 1.1 minus the stock price at time three. And we're looking at it on path. These are the, this is where the, these are the in the money, in the money. Uh, in the money paths at time two. These were, so we have to look at what is S3 on these five paths? Uh, what is S2 on these uh, five paths? And this is what they record in that next table. So let me bring that table back up. So first X, this is my S2 over here. So let's just double check that these values here of X is exactly the same thing as S2, right? These are the in the money paths. So this is where uh, S2 is less than 1.1. So we go back up to here, these values over here, where are the less than 1.1? Uh, this was path one, path three, path four, path six and path seven. Those are the ones that are being recorded over here. So that's my x. Now, what is y? So remember the formula I had. y was you take uh, the value uh, k minus s3, k minus s3, and then you discount it. Okay, so the discount factor, this is this 0.94176. So let me write down on a piece of paper too. <clears throat> this number here, this number here, if you work out what it is, this becomes 0 0.94176. Right, so you take the exponential of minus, point zero, minus 0 0.06, and you're going to get a number that looks like this. And so you have k minus s3 here along those paths. And uh, that's what you see reported in the um, in the table. <clears throat> the first number here is what is that going to be? It's going to be k. That's one point one minus the value of the stock at time three. Okay, so it's going to be k. That's one point one minus one point three four. That's going to give us a negative number. So we're going to get a zero. So that's a zero. So we have 0 0.7 here. Okay, so we need to go out. This is on path three. Path number three, you have 1.03. Okay, you subtract that away from 1.1, 1 .1, you're gonna get 0 0.07. Okay, so that's what you see here. The next one is gonna be, you need to look at the stock price uh, at time three on path four, stock price, at time three on path four is over. I cannot highlight this one, they won't do it. Okay, so that's, um, that's 0.92 and you subtract that away from 1.1, 1 .1, you're gonna get um, uh, 0.18 and, and that's what you see here and so on. So those, those are the values on these uh, five paths where you're in the money. And now comes the trickier part, namely you have to perform regression. And you can see down here what he wants to regress on is, uh, is a constant, so that's what we did before, and x, that's what we did before, but he also wants to regress on x squared. Um, so that's, that's not what we did before. And uh, in general, this is a really bad idea. You should not do that. Um, here he is doing it. Um, gonna regress. Uh, <clears throat> 
you're going to regress y on uh, on a constant on x and x squared and so it's perfectly fine to do it on the first two but this one here this this is just a bad idea um the um the reason it is a bad idea is that uh, x x is not independent uh, of x squared right so you're regressing now on of course a constant is independent of anything so these two are fine but this x squared this is this is this is a bad idea <laughs> this is a bad idea um so the um, you want to regress uh you want to write y here as uh you want to write y as uh coefficient beta zero plus x uh, beta one plus beta two uh x squared plus some noise. So what are those coefficients? What are those coefficients? So let me show you how to find these coefficients. So we already looked at an example where we didn't have that middle part. So we just found uh, beta zero and beta one. Now uh, there's also beta two. But we can find these coefficients. Yeah, let me show you how that works. So again, in the um, in the paper, we have <clears throat> five data points. We have five data points. We have five data points for x. We have five data points of y. We want to regress uh, y on x. Right? Y is measurable with respect to time three, and uh, x is measurable with respect to time two. So we're going to project this a time three measurable random variable onto the time two measurable random variables. And they are saying that you should, in this section of the paper that you're proposing, you regress on a constant and then a quadratic function, uh, so x and x squared, and then you get these coefficients out. And let me show you how to find these coefficients. And it's very similar to what we did before. So up here, uh, let me put them side by side so it's easier to compare. What I did was I took I took the x variable, so I copy pasted these five values for the x variable, and I copy pasted these uh, five variables, uh, these five uh, data points for the y, and I put them into two matrices called x two and y two. Right, so again, remember uh, y is nothing else than uh, the intrinsic value of the American option. Uh, at time three, right? So it's these values out here subtracted away from 1.1 and then you take positive part. So that's that's all the values you get 0 0.07, 0 0.18, 0 0.2, 0 0.09, and then you discount it. And that's what I've been doing. I just pulled out that discount factor that I have sitting here. So this is going to give me. Uh, uh, two sequences of data point x's and y's and i'm now following what you're suggesting that you should regress on a constant coefficient so i'm going to that coefficient is uh, just a bunch of ones as before and then x and x squared and uh, if i do that i will get let me bring over here where the code is so if i do long seven watts right so again this is, uh, these are the three variables I'm regressing on. I have the constant coefficient, I have X, and then I have X squared. And it, the problem of course being that the last two columns, they're not independent. They also do not, they don't have zero covariance. Nevertheless, it's gonna, when I do it, I, uh, I get the three values of beta, right? So it's beta zero, write out on a piece of paper here so according to my matlab code beta zero is uh, 1.07 uh, beta one is 2.9834 and beta two the coefficient in front of x squared this was minus 1.8136 and if you go back if you go back uh, and compare 
with what we have in the paper go back and compare what we have in the paper right so dear you, you're saying that the first coefficient should be a minus 1.07 this is what i have and the next one should be 983 this is pretty close to what i have oh i just have another digit yeah so here i would have put a minus 1.814 because it's a six over here but it's pretty close to what they have okay so that that gave me the um the regression coefficients and so the next step is uh, this is what we do the approximation. So let me show you that on a piece of paper. All right, so we now have we now have the uh, and we now have the regression coefficients. And so what we do is we replace uh, we replace this is a their algorithm. We replace y by um, we replace uh, yi by x uh, by this uh, beta zero so this is 1.07 plus 2.9834 xi minus 1.8136 xi squared like this one here this was f3 measurable not f2 right so i replace it by the best uh, approximation that i can come up with this thing here this is f2 measurable <clears throat> so that that column in in that figure is now going to be uh, replaced with um it's going to be replaced with uh, uh, instead of having the yi i's i'm going to replace it with this uh, regression coefficient and it's fairly straightforward to compute when you uh, when you have the coefficients right just you just plug it in so that's what i'm doing here i have my um in my MATLAB code now, when I get down to here, I have my beta coefficients. And so the only thing I'm doing now is I'm just taking uh, taking the X variables and plugging them into the formula. So I have beta, well, in the MATLAB code, the first entry is called one. So I have the, the constant coefficient, the constant beta coefficient, the linear beta coefficient times X1 and the quadratic and the quadratic uh, coefficient times X, X1 squared. And so instead of having instead of having the y variables up here, I will now have these ones that I get out, um, these ones that I get out from uh, from running the um, the deep regression. And so over in the code, I regress the y variables on the constant one, the x, the x squared. I got out the betas. Now I'm going to replace all the y variables with this vector here. <clears throat> and so that's how that's how this last piece is created you see up here this is where you had the y variables now these y variables are going to be replaced by the column that we have down here <coughs> excuse me and this column that you have down here this is exactly the same column that i have over here i have my five paths that are in the money so it's 0 0.0367 we have 0.369, so that's the first one. Uh, 0.0461, I have 0.0459, so they're close. I honestly don't know what the descriptions are coming from. Um, the last two, the second to last is exactly the same, and the last one is 1565, I have 1564. <clears throat> so this is an expression for the continuation value, so this is what you've been writing here. And on the other hand, you have your, your X variables up here. This is, this is the stock price at time two. That's, that's X. That's the stock price at time two. And when you compare that to 1.1, you're going to get the value out uh, if you exercise immediately. So this is, you subtract these numbers here away from the strike K being 1.1, you're going to get 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 0 0.10, 0 0.11, 0 0.12, 0 0.
point one three and 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 so on. And so you can continue, you can compare these two values now and say, well, which one is bigger? Is it more profitable for you to exercise immediately, or is it more profitable for you to uh, continue holding on to the to the stock? Is it going to give you this? And you compare the two, uh, compare the two, uh, the two columns, and you see what you get. And this will give you. Uh, so let's go all the way back to the beginning. When did we exercise? Well, at time three, you would exercise on these paths. So you had the one, two, three, there were four paths you would exercise on at time three. And now you're looking at when would you exercise at time two? Well, you'll compare these numbers here. Uh, you'll compare these numbers here. And uh, when would you exercise? You exercise on. Uh, which one's the biggest? You would exercise on path four, six, and seven at time two. And so you record that here. You exercise at path four, six, and seven. And you will not exercise on uh, what was the other path during question. You will not exercise on path one. You will not exercise on path three. So, so this gives you this. You will exercise on path three at the end you will not exercise on path one uh, at time two and time three. <clears throat> so you're filling in, you're filling in the, uh, uh, the cash flow that you're gonna get at time two and at time three. Are we good so far? Otherwise, we're going to do it one more time. Uh, we also have to fill in the cash flow at time one. And um, so, how do we do the cash flow at time one? <clears throat> well, the first step is to figure out what paths are in the money. So, this is the third step. So, in the money at time, at time, uh, at time one. Uh, what paths are we looking at? So what paths are we looking at? We go up to the stock price that we started by simulating. So now we're looking at these ones. Which paths are in the money, right? So this is where we have to make the, money, the decision. If we're out of the money, it doesn't matter. Uh, we're not going to exercise the timeline. If we're in the money, we should consider paths uh, one. We should consider paths four. We should consider paths six, seven, and eight. So these are the paths in question. Here are the ones that are in the money at time one. And then now we proceed exactly like before. We proceed exactly like before. We, we pull back, we pull back the, the cash flows that we have at the later time. We're looking at paths one, four, six, and seven. <clears throat> Okay, so what are the what are the cash flows on these paths? We're looking at path one, four, six, and seven. So the first cash flow, the first cash flow here on path one. This is at time two, uh, and there is no there's no cash flow. There's a zero. Then we're looking at path four. There's a cash flow now at point one three. And there's a cash flow on six that is 0.33. There's a cash flow at seven that is 0.26. And there's a zero cash flow on um, there's a zero cash flow on uh, path eight. Okay, so these cash flows they have to be moved. The ones that are in the money, path one, four, six, seven, and eight, they have to be moved to time one. Okay, so we do that by discounting. That's what's happening here. These are the cash flows: zero, one, zero. 0 0.13, 0 0.33, 0 0.26, and 0 0.00. We move these cash flows um, one step, but depending on where they are, here all those cash flows are at, 
we're at time two, it could have been if we will also have to be looking at path three, then that cash flow would be sitting out at time three. So that would have to be moved two steps. But here, all the on those paths that we're interested in, the cash flow comes at the next time. So we're just going to be multiplying by exactly the same discount factor as what we had before. And now your X, this is uh, this is again going to be uh, the um, this is going to be the current uh, stock price. So this is S1. So the values is Z on the X. This is going to be exactly the same ones that we have up uh, up here under S1 on these pairs, pairs uh, one, four, six, seven, and eight. Right, so the, if you take those numbers and you copy paste them down here, that's what it will, that's what will be under your X variable. This will be the stock price at time one. Okay, so now we have your Y's, you have your X's, and you perform the same sort of regression as we did before. Okay, so let's go look at the code. Uh, this is the second chunk of my code is down here. And so what are we doing? You have your X's, so these are, the stock prices at time one. This here is S1. And the X is up here, the Y is two. Then, uh, so you have your, your X's, the Y's, you'll have to discount these cash flows that get a later time, but because all the cash flows are coming, uh, it's either gonna be zero or exactly coming at time two, you just discount uh, with, that same discount factor as from before. Then you run your regression. You uh, regress on uh, a constant coefficient. You regress on the stock, and you regress on the stock squared. That's what you propose, and you're going to get new beta coefficients. So let's see how it looks like when you when you run the code. So now we're down. Uh, maybe I should print out what this a one is so you can see it. So, so up here, this is how it looked like in the first step. K1, this is how it looks like in the second uh, in the second step at time one. You have the constant coefficient, you have the stock price at time one, you have the stock price squared at time one. You run regression and you're gonna get these three new beta coefficients. There's gonna be a new intercept, there's gonna be a new coefficient, the linear coefficient, and then the quadratic coefficient are gonna be a little bit different. You can see they're being quite different, right? Uh, it really changes signs dramatically over here compared to uh, the, the two uh, beta, the two sets of betas are, are quite different. And this would be a red flag, right? If you have such a big change, um, this seems this seems off. Um, but nevertheless, this is how they do it. Um, and if you run down, we can compare to what D had uh, and what I have. So D have 2.038. I have 2.0375, uh, pretty close, minus, you see that's the minus signs that I, I, I don't like because it's really, it changed signs quite, the same change signs everywhere compared to the first one. So it's a sign of instability, but the coefficients you know, align pretty well with what I have. And then, then, you, then you move on, you replace, um, you replace your, uh, your yi by uh, will be 2.0375 minus 3.3354 times uh, x minus plus 1.3565x. Just show you my document camera a bit bigger. So, so you have this, and then you regress. You're going to get the new regression coefficients just as before, and and this one here, this one here was f uh, two measurable. I mean, after all, this is this is how we how we made it, and then this one here, this is going to be f one measurable. So we project in this lead square manner uh, a random variable that is not measurable onto this smaller uh, subspace where you have the correct measurability. And then you're you're in uh, you're in business. Then the uh, the next thing is to replace uh, do the substitution. And, and this is what we see in the last in the last uh, in the last column, right? So the 
the random variables that don't have the right measurability is these uh, y's. So we can plot them out. If I plot them out, right? See the y's up here, the y ones. These three here, they do not have the correct measurability. So I do the regression, and then I get these values down here instead. I get these values here instead of those ones. These ones do not have the right measurability. These ones here do. Um, and and then I'm then then I'm done because I can go back. And now I have the I have expressions for. Uh, I have expressions for continuation. I have expressions for, of course, I just look at what do I get if I exercise at time one? And I can compare the two. Do I want to exercise? Do I want to continue? If I want to exercise, I get 0.1. Uh, it doesn't look like I want to exercise on the first path. I want to exercise on the second path, the third path. And I want to exercise on the first path, the fourth path. I don't want to exercise on the first path. I want to exercise on the fourth, fifth, fourth, sixth, seventh, and eighth paths. And this gives us this, uh, uh, it gives us this uh, a picture of um, uh, the optimal stopping time uh, for this problem. You will see when do you exercise and when do you just continue? These paths where there are no, these, um, these paths, these columns in the matrix where there are no ones, it means that we don't exercise. Um, and this was the uh, this was the last bit. So now we have the cash flow. We know what uh, we know what we get, and we know when we get it. So what we do is we just roll it back to time uh, zero, discounting, and then adding it up and uh, taking the average. And so that's what I did in the last step. Uh, I have these eight pairs. I know what the payoff is on each of the eight pairs. I just roll it back to time zero. So this one here has to be rolled back uh, three time steps. These ones here only have to be rolled back one time step. And then I take the average. And this is what I did in the last one. This is the last line I have. Uh, there are four payoffs coming at time one. I roll these four payoffs just back once. And then there is one payoff that comes at time three. And this one has to be rolled back uh three time uh that you have to multiply by minus you have to multiply by three because it comes three time steps later and you add them up and then you have eight paths so you take the average and this is going to give you um this is going to give you the option price down here to be uh whatever point uh, one one four four and i think this is pretty well aligned with what they ended up getting, what they ended up getting in the paper. Uh, yeah, this is a very good line with what they ended up getting in the paper, 0. 0.1144. Are there any questions on on these numbers? How the mechanics work? So again, you're regressing in this simple example here, just on a constant coefficient, you're regressing on the stock price and the stock price squared. It is not in general a very good idea to regress on uh, these variables that are uh, that are not independent, or at least uh, you should at least have that these variables you regress on, uh, they have zero covariance with each other. Otherwise, um, right, if, if you have this sort of dependency, you can switch I mean, some of the coefficients that you're estimating, right? It's not, if you regress on two coefficients and decovary, then you could move some of the coefficient from one to the other without changing anything. So having, having dependent or, or even having correlated 
uh, variables that you regress on. This is in general a bad idea. Um, so let me show you. Let me show you just how it would look like in the um, in the homework setting if we were to um, look at my code for uh, homework six. <clears throat> so here I'm running it with a much, much larger number of pairs. The, the only thing that I wanted to highlight is, um, <clears throat> is just you, you could regress on many other things. You could put more stuff in here. So this is the A matrix uh, from before. You can see all I'm doing here is I'm just singling out in the money and out of the money pairs. I'm, I'm playing a little bit around with how to simulate because instead of growing all these pads from time zero, you can actually just start out again from the end. You don't have to grow all the pads just from the beginning. You can do it, but you could also just start out with terminal values because you know it's a geometric running motion. So you could just simulate what is capital T is directly. And then given is capital T, you can simulate what the stock price would be one instant before. And um, I did that because we had this brownie motion uh, with the bridge feature in one of the earlier exercises and and you can you can use some of that material here um so you don't have to do that it's just i didn't i wanted to make it such that i didn't have to store all the paths like if you have how many paths do i have here i have uh i have a million paths and i forget how many time steps probably a hundred or a thousand time steps like so it grows up to be quite a bit of memory that you have to use and, and by doing it this way, you only have to store the last stock price. So it made it just a little bit simpler for the memory. Um, one of you, uh, two, some of you, I, I think it was Alice that was, that has been asking about um, vectorization, how to make your code run faster. And well, another way to make your code run faster is to not use so much of your uh, memory storage. So this is one way to speed that up, uh, simply by, like, here the, the propose, I do propose that you generate this entire matrix of stock paths. Because that means you have a story. So if you have a million paths and you have a, a thousand time steps, then you want to have a quite a bit of memory devoted to storing this stock price matrix. And so what I'm proposing is you could just simulate the terminal values. And then you could use uh, conditional expectation. So what would what would the bridge structure be that would take you from time three to time two? And then we don't need to go back. I'll just have to simulate this second to last column instead of having the entire matrix, right? And then I could overwrite the last values because I don't need them anymore. And so this would free up memory. Thereby making my code run faster. Right. So Alice, this is just another trick when you you can vectorize your code that will make it go faster, but you can also be um, careful when you when you spend your memory. Um, maybe spending your memory these days is not such a big deal because computers have so much memory, but um, nevertheless, this is how I did it here. Um, so <clears throat> the thing I really wanted to highlight is you could put a bunch of other things in here. You don't have to. So here again, I'm just regressing on a vector of constant ones. And then I'm regressing on one minus X and then whatever these ones here are, there's like one, two, three. Uh, there are three functions of this X, right? And X is just my stop price. Okay. So, and there's another one here that looks a little bit different. Now it's exponentiated. And again, there are like three or four things that I'm regressing on. And every time you regress, you're going to get more of these betas coming out of your regression mechanism. But these polynomials here, they have the feature that when you take inner product between them, you're going to get zero. These are orthogonal. And um, they call the Guerre polynomials. And so let me show you how the formulas are. These are the Laguerre polynomials you have here. And, and so Laguerre polynomials, they have this is an orthogonal. Uh, they be orthogonal, so doing inner products with them. Uh, yeah, this this is a lot better than taking the stock and the stock spread. And I, I put out 
so there are Okay, so we have the constant and you have something that is linear then you have something that's quadratic so we have something that is to the power three and so on and of course you could keep going up here uh, as, as you so desire and then running the code on them there was another question I see any questions In Young says that memory can still be a problem. Yeah, so I, I, I uh, being careful about how you allocate memory, this, this can be, um, this, I, I think it's just always a good idea to be careful about how you spend your memory. Uh, so that's why I propose to do with this, uh, this conditional. Uh, Instead of simulating the entire full matrix, you just simulate that part of the matrix that you need. And since we're always doing dynamical programming, we start from the very end and then we go backwards, right? So you basically have to simulate like a stock price backward, right? So you know what the terminal values are because you simulated them directly. You know that ST is a geometric rounding motion. So you just simulate an increment of the rounding motion that'll take you from time zero to time capital T. And then you go, uh, then you go backwards. But just one, one step at a time. And, uh, and that's going to free up uh, a lot of this memory. And that being said, like conceptually, conceptually, this class is not about uh, it's not about writing the most efficient code. Um, but the issue came up with with Alice about I think it was Alice. So Alice, I'm I, I don't want to single you out. It's just when you write code, naturally it comes up like how fast is your code running? What works? What doesn't work? Uh, what works a little bit better um, to being exposed to these things in a, in a homework it, it's just it's it's natural to come up when you do uh, all your homeworks have had these implementation components to it and so you start running into these issues where like your code simply just does not run fast enough and even if it's that if it sits there cooking all night long uh, it might crash it might not work um, so you, you you're exposed to some of these things that you might not might not think would be an issue. Um, it was interesting to, uh, I mean, there are other things that you will be exposed to when you when you go out and work. Uh, like you, you typically run your code on a single computer. Um, but in practice, you would never do that. You would always run the same code on multiple computers, right? Because you run a real chance uh, of one of the computers crashing, right? And so if you have a large comp computation to do typically overnight, you need to run that on multiple computers, the same code uh, for verification to see if it works uh, properly. And also just to hedge against uh, stuff crashing, power outlets uh, and, and so on. But when you start having uh, lots and lots of computers uh, failure, it, among some of these computers, is, is that's going to happen, right? When you have a huge farm of computers, some of them are going to fail uh, on a regular basis. And so here in a class setting like this one, you typically just, just like myself, you're working on one computer at a time. Um, but that will not be the case uh, when you, if, if you are to ever do large scale implementations in a bank, you will run this on multiple servers placed in multiple places of the world to hedge against. Uh, uh, software, uh, hardware failures, uh, power failures, and, and the likes. So that's something that you haven't been exposed to here, but there are, of course, other computational issues that, that are out there. Yeah, I think this is um, this is this is all I wanted to say about uh, uh, this is all I wanted to say about uh, how to deal with the long step swaps uh, uh, algorithm. The, the paper was published in the early 2000s. There have been a number of papers uh, coming out uh, both before and after, but this was kind of the one that, that, that made it. Um, that was the one that stuck. Uh, there are, there, there's no proof that this method works. There's no, uh, it, it doesn't, the paper doesn't have anything like that. This came out much later. Uh, there are also lots of refinements, uh, improvements on the original long self sports method um, that also came out later. This is a paper, I think is cited by 4,000 uh, 
researchers. So it's 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 it's, it's, it's been out for what twenty years, uh, published twenty years ago. So it's probably been out for like twenty five years. Um, it's definitely a classic way of using simulation to price uh, to price American uh, options in particular. And um, yeah, are there any questions on this? So I mean, this this concludes everything that um, that I had. Uh, um, I it, it's deliberate that I I'm not not overloading you guys with new material here at, uh, at the very end. It is to give you guys some time to uh, to free up some of your time to work on these projects. Are there any questions or comments before we uh, we start? Um, could I ask you to briefly go over the Brennan Schwartz algorithm again? Yeah, yep. So this is from, um, that's from last time or two times ago? Yeah, I think it was just from last week. Yep. This is the one that you're going to need for, um, to get in your code to run for, um, for the homework. Right, so um, so the um, so when you have the American and the American put, you will end up with a system. Just write down what the system is. American put, right? So you're going to have this uh, this complementary system. So you will have, uh, uh, what do you end up with? You end up with something like um, R, I should use the same notation as in the homework so I don't cause more people to get confused. So you bring up the homework. No, it's not even mentioned here in the homework. So and we call it U, like we are, I'm just going to copy paste this uh, this system from the from the homework. So we have RF. RF is uh, dominating uh, FT plus RX FX, and then one half sigma squared x squared FXX. And then you'll have F needs to dominate the obstacle, which is uh, K minus X, and then at least. You'll also have that at the end, this is k minus x. And then you'll have at least one, at least one of these ones uh, holds, holds as you call it. Right, that was this complementary system that, that we derived last time. And so what it becomes, what it becomes is really so you will face, so now we do the approximation when the, um, uh, you decide on, on what numerical scheme you want to use. So you want to use the implicit, the explicit, or the crank nicholson scheme. And that means you have to replace the various derivatives with um, uh, whatever the appropriate uh, difference, uh, differences would be. But you want to end up, you end up with something, you end up facing, we end up facing a system that looks like, say, A 
and then you'll have a vector which is bigger than b and you would have to dominate the obstacle so let me call that psi and then you would have to have that at least one of these two guys holds but you would have to have that a u minus b inner product with u minus psi right these are the inner product between two positive vectors i want this to be zero and this is going to force that either that one holds or this one holds or they both hold so we end up facing this this system here u here is your u here is the unknown so this is u uh, you one, you two, you and this is the unknown. Uh, B, B inside the unknown, you're given. A is also given. A is a matrix. So the question is, how do you solve such a system? Well, <clears throat> the approach for Brennan Swartz is this trick. And uh, the Brennan Swartz trick says that, so this, this here is my F. And uh, so I have my K, I have my K, I have my obstacle. So out here is where I have to stop. The Renan Swartz algorithm says, well, the, the, the first idea is if you compute the European one. So if I am to compute the European one, you would do write this in red. This one here could be the European one. This is from uh, homework five, right? You would have something like that. And so what the first thing that you could do is you could just keep it out here and just move it up like that. And then you could say, well, is that going to be the, is that going to be yeah, a solution, right? You could try to lift, you could keep, keep these values, keep, and then you could lift, you could lift these ones up. So you would go up here instead, and then you lift here. That will give you something that you could think would be um, a solution uh, to this system up here of, of uh, inequalities, but it doesn't work. And the reason that it doesn't work is because right here, you're going to fail. You're going to fail to be uh, smooth. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no if x uh, at at this point. And you know that there's supposed to be, uh, there's supposed to be exactly that. Like this here has slope what minus minus one. So you know it should be. You should have you should have f of x equal to minus one at that point. So this here does not work. So Brennan Swartz says that it almost works. The only thing you have to do is you have to swap it. So you're coming in from this side here, and then you, you move up along. That doesn't work. But if you swap it around, if you if you replace if you replace x, uh, so replace x by say um, x h minus x and that means that you're just swapping what you have done here so so over here you have your x h this is your upper cutoff and you have your obstacle and then you would have this so that will be okay this one will be okay and now what you do is you just solve starting from in here you know that for x big um, for x big, uh, the obstacle binds, and equivalently, like right, for x small up here, the obstacle you, you're going to be, uh, it's going to be the case that uh, you exercise. So here for x big, you exercise. Right. So you add the obstacle up here, and so what you do is you move down along this obstacle, and at some point it's going to get lifted. And this is going to give you, so this here is going to give you a smooth fit.
<clears throat> so you, because we're doing this uh, LU factorization, we, we're coming in from this direction here, we're coming in from this way. And uh, so we have to be a play, be in a situation where the obstacle is binding. So we need to swap around what our domain is, but that's not a big deal. I would just replace X by, uh, by this difference where you're out here on the right. And then, and how, how would you then go about doing it? Well, you, you proceed. So to do this, uh, you proceed, uh, you proceed exactly as in homework five. But you write your matrix up here, your A, you're gonna do that in an LU. So you're gonna write A as LU, where So L is the lower triangular. So L has the form is one on the diagonal, but then it's zero up here. And then there's something just off the diagonal and then zeros. That's your lower triangular. And then you have your upper triangular. So the upper triangular is gonna be, there'll be something on the diagonal. And then there'll be something just to the right. And then there'll be zeros. <clears throat> because your, your A matrix, your A matrix, this is, um, this is tri-diagonal. So you're gonna, you're gonna end up with this structure here for your L and U. And so for Europeans, how did you proceed? Well, you need to solve, uh, you need to solve uh, A uh, U equals B. So for Europeans, what you did was, well, you replace this thing. This becomes a L U times U. Right. So as for Europeans, to so step one, you solve uh, L V equals B. Right. So that's you combine these two here. Or you combine these two into a V and you solve this thing for V. And then for Europeans, so this is in step two, for Europeans, you then solved, uh, what would it be? Uh, you would solve, this would be uh, should be V. So you have to have uh, you'd have to have U U U equal V. But this this needs to be replaced now. So so don't do that anymore. Um, so now, so instead, instead do. This is where we're going to use that. So this here's the Brennan Swartz. instead do what so instead so our vector u remember what the vector u this was an nth it had nth component right so you had your u vector this would be u1 down to un and so what what would we do is we interested in we interested in un Right, so in from all the way out here now, and we know it's binding. So you're going to have that U end, this is going to be an obstacle. It binds here at the end. 
And now how would we go about, well, normally we would solve this thing here. Normally we would just solve this thing here. So if, if I were to proceed as you did for Europeans, then, so if you do the European ones to get the next one, you'd have U, you'd have U N, maybe I should write it out. Uh, right, so we down here, this here was the last one, this one here, N, right, that's so why we had N minus one. <clears throat> so if I write out this restriction here for the second to last row, what would I, I would have U, the matrix evaluated at N minus one, N minus one times U N minus one. And that's the matrix times the second to last element in here, u n minus one plus, and then this element, this element here is that one. And I'm also gonna need this one here. This is gonna be u. I am in the second to last row and I am in the last column, I'm multiplying that on to the last element in U, this is gonna be U N. But this is how we would solve, this would be my V N minus one, right? And that was the one you got from the, uh, from the step one. This is my vector, this is a V one down to V N. This is also the European one. And so you can solve this here for, you know what this one is because you already picked it. Uh, you can solve this equation for UN minus one, right? So if I solve this here for UN minus one, and I think I had a typo here that, I think it was Amy that caught the typo here a few times ago. So I'll see if I can make it better this time. I'll move this term to the other side. This is VN minus one minus, and then it's the matrix. times what we already know, because we set it up there. And then you divide by this term, U, the matrix at the diagonal. But that's how we would do for the European. But now comes the trick for the American, you're gonna compare now with the obstacle. You're gonna say that this is U N minus one, this is gonna be max. And then you're looking at the obstacle and then this value. Divided by the diagonal element. So this is what we have in the picture. You start out being at the obstacle, you go one down, you're comparing the value you would get by solving uh, as in the European case with the obstacle. And so in the beginning, you're gonna be following the obstacle, but at some point you're gonna get a bigger value uh, by solving the equation. And then this thing lifts off and you're gonna get the function. Right, so this, this here is where the nonlinearity comes in. This is where uh, the algorithm uh, differs from what we would do for the, um, for the European one. And Amy, I hope I didn't make any typos here. So if you see one, now is a good time to, to tell me. Does that make sense, Sherry? Yes, that makes sense. Thank you. Welcome. There's one more question. Yeah, shoot. How do we adjust? How do we adjust the PDE for the flipped axis? Okay, so yeah, let me help you with that. Okay. 
way that that that's not that is not too bad to do. Uh, let me just let me just show you how how it would look like in my um, uh, right. So Enyon, if you look at the top part here, this is equation 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 number three, right? That's the one that we derived in class. So you have your PDE and you have your F. Right? So this is F evaluated at t comma x. And so <clears throat> what, what the new function is going to do, this is my u. I'm going to flip not only the x-axis, I'm also going to flip time because I want to start out. We, we've done that before. You did that in the homework, uh, homework number five as well. Instead of having a terminal condition, you want to have an initial condition. And so the only thing you do is you just define a new function where time is running backwards and where uh, where the new x variable is going to be x, the upper uh, cutoff minus x. And then you just you compute derivatives for, for this function here with respect to t and with respect to x. And of course, all these derivatives can be expressed in terms of derivatives of f with respect to its first entry and of f with respect to its second entry. And so you get a new PD. This, the PD is going to look like this one here. And then now you're going to get like your, your initial condition, like u at zero. This is going to be equal to f at capital T comma xh minus x, right? So you have to replace this x up here by xh minus x. So you're going to get like a, an initial condition that looks like this. So you see here when x is big, uh, you, you're going to be exercising, right? So before it was when X was small, you would be exercising. But when X here is equal to XH, this last term drops out and you're just going to have K. Yep. Other questions? Other questions? All right, then um, there will be office hours uh, tomorrow morning. The TA will have office hours tonight and tomorrow night. And then next week is when the projects are due. There will be some office hours uh, on uh, Wednesday and Thursday morning at nine. If you have questions about uh, your project, what um, you know, just bring them forward and, and we can have a discussion about them. Otherwise, your projects are due um, uh, next Thursday at midnight. Okay, this is the last lecture. It's a bit short. Uh, I didn't want to put more material in here. I want to give you guys a little chance uh, to, to have some more time spending on, on your homework and on your project. Are there any other questions before we start? Okay. Then I wish you all the very best. If I don't see you, I wish you the very best and um, yeah, take care.